customer focus because we're going to be talking about how to navigate control panel especially if you cannot remote access to the user imagine trying to help a user has internet problems on the phone not going to be easy if you have no clue how to communicate to the user how to use control panel go to internet options and especially go to change adapters and many other things that we're going to explain forward in our lesson. So let's just jump into it. So first we need to talk about the control panel overview. This is most likely going to be the first place you're going to be using to configure your settings. Now the control panel is a great way that centralizes most of your controls and windows. I say most, not all, but there is one thing that it will do a great job of, and that is basically giving you a collection of something that Windows calls applets. Basically, they're apps, very, very small apps, and they call them applets that are designed to help you customize and change the settings in Windows. And there are some versions that have changed over the time, but there are some that are very common. And we're going to also be mentioning when sometimes your window will be different from everybody else's where you may have a little bit more applets or a little bit less and that depends on what programs or special hardware you have on your computer this is basically what it looks in windows 10. this is the category option the large and the small i'm going to go in more detail shortly in the next slides just to give an idea of what it looks like in the active system here. So there are a few ways that you can access control panel. Me personally, the star location is usually what I will do. So on my keyboard, I have the star button and from there I just type control panel. But there are other ways you can do it. You can locate a literal icon for the control panel on your step menu. You could also on Windows 8 or 8.1, if it's touch paddleable, you can actually swipe the screen. And also you could use your mouse, but I struggle using the mouse, but it is possible to do with the mouse if you use the charm menu in Windows 8. I believe you can also hold, let me see, can, does it work holding? No, it doesn't work Windows 10. So I was holding the logo start button, it doesn't work there. So I think that's only feature for Windows 8 and 8.1. Now Windows 10, you get a little bit more options. You can either scroll for it, where there's a dedicated button, or you can type it. And sometimes you can also do it on the drop, meaning that it's a little special app area on the start button, you can click it. Good news is that all those methods that I mentioned are not important for the real exam. It's important for you to know in the real world that Windows has different ways for you to get to control panel. So find the one that works best for you and just be aware that there are other ways to get to it. My opinion, the easiest one to use is just searching for it with your search. If you just click the window button, well, I won't show because of the screen, but if you click the start button window and search for it, that would be usually the fastest, most convenient way if you haven't toggle with an older version of Windows. So that's for the real world. Now for the exam, like I said, you don't need to know too much about that. That's actually something that they just mentioned. You just need to know how to get there and you're good to go there. Now, locating is a different story. Locating the applets is very important. And to locate them, yes, you can use the search bar, but here's an issue. If you're not sure what you're searching for, you're gonna have to browse through categories instead. And that's gonna help us find out what I'm looking for. If you don't know the name, you can't really search for it. But if you know the categories, it can help you search for it. And that's where it talks about the viewpoints here. The one I just mentioned here a while ago, we got here category, which helps us browse. We got large and small icon. These are actually the same thing as just how it looks, maybe a little bit bigger. I prefer looking bigger or a little bit smaller. So these are valid options. And a lot of people prefer this option here, viewing everything. I prefer it too, and I will say that this is what most professionals will rather use, but we need to be adaptable. We need to be growth mindset here and be used to also category, especially for the exam. 
So let's start looking at some examples of that. So over here, like the slide was mentioning before, we got categories. Categories are trying to make things easy for new users to use Windows. If you're experienced, you're more likely to use the small or large icon. It's just, well, you know what you're looking for, so you can just select it. But if you don't, this helps tremendously. System and security, network, and internet. Look at all these options we got. So I have an idea where I can go if I'm trying to find something, if I have no idea how to look for it. Let's look at another example here, large icons and small. Reason why I skip them quick to them because they're basically the same thing. It's just your preference. You want the icons to look a little bit bigger? Well, large icon, you want to look a little bit smaller? Well, you got your option right here. This is just how it looks. Now, the reason why we're going to spend extra time on categories is because most users are going to only know how to operate the categories. If you show them this on the phone and they're just telling you, what do I click next? And they're looking and they may click the wrong one. It's going to make things a little bit more difficult for the user. The user may get stressed just looking at this. I'm not stressed looking at it. But maybe for someone who has no idea about how computers work and you're telling them on the phone, hey, I need to go to your control panel, go to device manager. The second they go to the control panel and they click on whatever setting they have here and you tell them, oh, you have to go by small icons or big icons and then look for device manager or search for it. They may be overwhelmed just looking at this. And also very important mention by default, Windows shows you this. So if you don't even mention to them the category and you tell them, hey, go to device manager, the user is gonna be here saying, I can't find it. If they're smart, they may go to hardware and sounds because they know, but most of the people that we're gonna be talking to in the IT world, they're not gonna know this. They know usually very little. So you gotta be mindful of that. And that's why customer focus is so important. So let's get to the nitty gritty of this. We're gonna talk about the categories and most likely how you're gonna be explaining to users how to get there. And the first one is system insecurity. So let's jump into that one. So over here, we have options for the action center, that's our notification center, your firewalls, systems. Oh, interesting, also has remote access here. Basically everything you see here is very explanational. It's very upfront. Anything that's related to system and security is all here, including power options. So this is something to remember. If you need something related to system and security, most likely is gonna be here in this category, including some weird ones like this one down here, Flash Player 32-bit. I will explain in the future why that's there and most likely on your computer right now. And it has to do with the security problem with Flash Player. I believe Flash Player has been decommissioned, I believe, in 2020, right? Yeah, yeah it has. Sure. It's dead. Yeah, good. Is, I mean, I love Flash Player, but man, I got so many viruses because of it. That's one tip I'll give. If we have spare time, I'll explain exactly how this vulnerability works. Now, Category 2 is talking about networks and internet. So you'll have a lot of options here. You can select network sharing, home group, internet options. I can tell this is Windows 7 because with Windows 10, they removed the home group. So I only have two options and I can actually show that here. Let me go into my control panel. Oh, did I delete it? I deleted it, so I have to put my control panel on. There we go. So if I go to the network, you see Grom home group is gone. Take a note about that because on the Comtia and Kaplan, you may get a trick question about that when they're talking about Windows 10 and related to groups. It's a little tip there. And let's go to the next category, hardware and sound. This one, oh, it's kind of what it says here, but there's one that I want to stress out here. So we have device, printers, power options again. Oh, look, it came up again. I wonder why. Displays. And hmm, this is interesting, Windows Mobile Center. 
and then HP Power Manager and HP Beat Audio. The one I want to stress out is autoplay. Who here has an idea why autoplay would be here? I can see you have your hands up, Chris. Let me know. It causes to play automatically DVDs, CDs, or thumb drives that have stuff on them. Correct. And that's a great one to put out there. So technically speaking, it is related to hardware. And then you see these other applets. These are specialized applets that come with your computer or you installed a new program. So for example, you got HP Power Manager. That's telling me that the person that has this computer must have an HP that's using HP software and HP itself has an applet, a custom de design applet for Windows to use. And when I say custom, since I know some programming, just put a shortcut, but you don't need to know that. <laughs> these are basically just shortcuts to their programs. And that's what all these things are on your control panel. They're just shortcuts to these little programs that you run to help configure your computer, help with the settings. That's what control panel is. It's just an over glorified file system for shortcuts. But it's nice that you have this interface, this GUI because the original way to do it will be the control line. So it makes the job easier, it looks nice. Let's now go to category four, programs. This one you gotta be a little bit careful about. And the reason why, because on the exam, unfortunately I can tell this is a Windows 7. Why? They changed the name to programs. Instead of being programs and features, well, actually no, they changed it back, didn't they? Let's see, did they change it back? They follow programs. Oh no, they changed it back. Never mind. So before they had an update with Windows where they changed it, but I think they've changed it back. All right, never mind. Scratch that. So over here, they're talking about programs and features and default programs and desktop gadgets. Now that one is important to mention. So as we mentioned before, gadgets are not a real thing that Windows uses anymore on their later systems. This guy probably installed or had a package that he wanted to use the gadgets in Windows. Upcoming Windows, you're not gonna really have that option unless you intentionally installed it from Microsoft. So that's one thing to important to mention. So if you see this, it could be two signs. One is Vista or two, it could be an older version of Windows 7. That's just for experience based kind of scenarios. I doubt you're going to get any real questions related to that on the test, so don't stress that out. Just something I notice here. Now, five is something that is very important. User account, parent controls, Windows, card space, and credential manager. This is important because on the tests, and that's including the Kaplan and the Comtia, there are so many questions that ask you, hey, where will you go to change the user's name? Where will you go to change the password? Or will you go to see how things are managed if you're using a more professional Windows edition, like professional or above, or asks you, hey, I need to change the group policy of something, or I need to audit something. Most of those questions will be answered in this category alone. User accounts, you use this to, well, any changes to user account. Parent control, I doubt you're gonna get too many questions related to parent control on any exams, but it's possible to ask you, hey, you wanna have limitations to your kids or anybody that uses a computer. Parent control can be used here as well. And then over here, this is a special applet, Windows card space. This is basically a way that you can use to, well, log any special programs you have. Let's see, manage information card that is used to log on to online services. So basically this is a, uh, a place where you can store your certificates. That's more advanced that is needed for the CompTIA A+. But basically, this is a way you can store your information that is related to logging into other services. And then over here, this is something that's important for you guys to know when you do virtual machines and you want to play with more advanced features. Now, that's a mouth word over here, but this is one thing that I will recommend if you have the time to study a little bit of extra detail for the exam. Very useful. Now, appearance and personality is another very common thing that you will see on the exam when they mention it. And the reason why is because of personalization and display. If I wanna change my resolution, I go to display. 
if I want to change how it looks, like for example, I want my windows to look a little bit darker or I want to change the background or heck, even change the sound. That's where you go to personalization. And then if you want to change something that's more of display, you go to here. The reason why these are very important to mention is because on the exam, they may try to trick you saying, hey, you want to go to personalization when if you want to change your resolution. Uh -uh. It will be incorrect. It will be display. So they may try to trick you with this one right here. So be a little bit aware of that. And then you have other options here that basically customizes your windows. Like what do you want to, your start bar to do? Also notice that you have ease of access control here. This is Windows 7 because if I go back to my applet here, this is Windows 10. They have now separate the category. As you can see here, I have this category separate now from appearance. Or maybe it's included. Let me double check. Let me see. Okay, so it's in both. Are they always changing things? So you have access to access here and appearance. And for those who are not aware what access is, access is basically for those who have difficulties using computer due to either eyesight or hearing. This is a great way to help those who have difficulties managing windows due to, well, any complications they have. And I love it. I've used this program many times for those who need help with hearing or seeing. Some of you guys might not be aware, why would hearing matter? Well, there are options here for those who are hard to hear and the programs will do a great job of making it easier for the person to hear it. Our little special programs that work too with that. And also you also have font size too that we're gonna to get to in the next few slides. Now, big note here, date and time, region and language. On the Comtia, I doubt you're gonna to get too many questions related to this, but for those who have Kaplan, Kaplan loves giving you questions related to these over here. So if you want anything to do with date and time and then region and language, this is where you would go. And be very careful that date and time and region and language are separate applets here. Very important to know they are separate. Now let's go to eight. Access. So I love access. Very useful for those who need it. And you have many things here. One, if you use access, because this app doesn't show you a lot about it, it Always really gives you it. options. Right now it's talking to me. Well, I'm pretty sure you guys should not be able to talk to it, but there's many options here to help people use access, make things easier for the people, for those who have a hard time reading. You can have high contracts mode. You can also use it with hotkeys. These are great things for those who are having difficulties using Windows. There's even, scan this section. sorry about that. There's even options here to help users hear and also see. Seeing is the most common one, but there are options here. Let me see, what can I find the hearing one? Here it is, it's usually here. Here you can put some options here, turn on visual notification for sound, sound sentry. So here you can use options to help with those who have difficult seeing and using your hearing instead. And you can also kind of change the theme of the sounds to make it easier for those who are part of hearing or they need a special way of hearing things. This is more advanced and you don't really need to know too much about this on the exam, but you may be across somebody in the field where they're having difficulty using the computer, they have hard of hearing and hard of seeing, and this will help you a lot if you're able to know the hotkeys. And you can just click a hotkey. Oh, where's that hotkey that I Always show? scan this section. Where's hockey? I'm trying to remember, I haven't used this in a long time. So there is a hockey here in Windows. I keep changing it. Where was it now? I can't remember where it is. I think it's here. Here we go. This is a very important hockey to know in the real world. If you have someone who has a hard time seeing, high contrast mode can make it very e a little bit easier for those who have difficulty seeing. Alt, left, shift, plus print screen will automatically put my whole system to high contract mode that basically lets the user see a little bit easier if they don't have that setting on. Just something Always to know in the real world. Section. And of course, speech recognition, that's actually pretty useful too. All right. Now, before I pass it to Kelly, 
some of you may be wearing Windows 10, you have this over here. Don't worry too much about this on the real exam. I doubt you're gonna get it. This is basically another method of control panel. It works similar to it. And a lot of the settings here are very similar to it as well. It's just that Windows 10 is trying to basically make a better control panel, make it more integrated, more centralized. Though we have to wait to see how Windows 10 evolves with this. So you don't have to worry about this for the real exam, maybe in the next iteration, but right now you don't have to worry about that. Just worry about control panel. So we'll continue talking about the control panel applets um, where you go to modify various things within your computer. And a lot of these should be pretty familiar, your internet options, your devices and printers, sound system, folder options. Some of them are pretty straightforward, some of them a little less so, and they like to, you know, move this stuff around with each new iteration of Windows. And as we were just discussing, almost with each new service pack uh, that comes out, they may move this stuff around. But having a good idea where to go to look for, um, to look in the areas for things that you want to do or get done will definitely help speed things up. All right, first one, internet options. That is your, you know, pretty straightforward. It is your internet connectivity. It will also, in there you will find your security, privacy, general settings, like if you're going to be operating off of Wi-Fi or, you know, cable, Ethernet, something along those lines. This is where you would go in and set up those functions so that you'll be able to get online. Like if your cable internet, your, your Ethernet cable fails, Will it go automatically to a Wi-Fi setting or is it just gonna fail at that point? If you do not have a backup, also selecting which Wi-Fi you're going to operate from. Jump to a different window here. Um, and things of that nature, I believe your cache files, internet history, all that stuff is stored in this particular location as well. Uh, display settings. Another one, pretty straightforward. This is where you do your resolution, your color displays, screen savers, how long it's going to be before your screen saver goes down. Great security feature uh, in enterprise uh, environment is if somebody gets up and leaves their desk, if you have people who have a tendency not to log out every single time that they get it from their desk, you can have a screen saver that turns on after about three or four minutes. That way, if they walk away, go to lunch, screensaver turns on and you can set it to, you know, that they have to actually enter the password to get back in through the screensaver. So it's another little extra layer of security that you can put on your computers as well. Uh, user accounts. Can anybody tell me, is it a good idea even in a home environment to basically just have a singular account on your computer that you use pretty much for everything? No. Nah. You'd want to have different user accounts if you, especially if it's a family computer and you got kids, you don't want your kids getting mm -hmm. into your files, you know, if you do your work and stuff like that. Okay. Now, if you're the main user on the computer, do you want basically to be operating in the administrator's account constantly? No. 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 Absolutely. And that goes, that holds true as well in an enterprise setting, you know, if, as an IT professional, you want to operate in a normal account as much as possible and only, only sign in or log in, to, you know, for administrative access when you absolutely and utterly need to. And then you sign out of the administrative access as soon as you are able. You want to, you know, operate within that parameter as little as possible because the longer you're in it, the more of a risk there is to the actual system that somebody can get in. But yes, in user accounts, you could set up a variety of accounts and also start establishing what authorities those accounts have, what access that they have, what they're able to view and things of that nature. Folder options. I believe we uh, briefly went over this one here right at the beginning of the break. Um, kind of allows you to 
adjust the experience you're going to have fit, you know, for your files, how they're organized, how you see them, general options for those files. You can hide the extensions. You can view the hidden files from the administrative aspect or hide files that you don't want others to see, other users, other options if you are sharing systems. System is the basic um, catch-all for your CPU specs, your RAM, your uh, version of Windows you're running, your, um, your ability to allow other, you know, if, if you want to access your files from a remote place or if you want to grant somebody access to your files, you can allow remote access, you, you know, computer name, and then your device manager and stuff is also under there as well as your virtual memory and everything, service pack, uh, versions, all that stuff is stored under file or your system applet. Is there any questions with regards to system? Nope. Oh, all right. Windows Firewall. This is, you know, your basic uh, firewall, but also try to remember this is for the specific computer you are working on. This does not account for your network. If you're operating off of a Windows Firewall, it is not protecting every device in your home. It is only protecting the computer you are on. This is also, you know, true in an enterprise environment. It is essentially um, protecting that singular computer and will oftentimes um, interact with your network firewall and give over control to that if that is a superior system. Any questions on Windows Firewall? I believe it's called Windows Defender Firewall now and Windows 10. That's correct. Power options. This is a good one. Um, we were talking about, I think I was told you guys a story yesterday or the day before I had a coworker who was not properly shutting down their system. They're really just playing the laptop closed, throwing it in the laptop bag and then driving, you know, driving home. Laptop still on during that process, essentially cooking inside that laptop bag, which is very well insulated. So it kept the heat in there nice and good and ended up burning through three computers in under a year until finally someone in the IT department came in and adjusted the power settings on the computer. And you can set it up to, you know, based on different scenarios, whether, you know, when you just close it, does it go into a sleep mode or does it go into hibernate mode? Um, how long does the computer stay on before it auto shuts down? All these things can be done within the power options. Can anybody tell me what the difference is between hibernate and sleep suspend? Hibernate um, saves more power in a sense than sleep. And uh, Hibernate, uh, I believe the data stays in the RAM. No, I don't think the data stays in the RAM for Hibernate. I think Hibernate is just a, a state to shut down a bunch of, um, um, not a lot, highly used services or whatever so that when you're ready to resume, it does it automatically. Oh, okay. and sleep is like um, to a point where you're right against the wall that's shutting down. I don't know how to explain it real well, but sleep well, is a sleep lot more. Kind um, of like sleep, it's still powered on. It comes down to a lower state. It will shut down or hot, you know, shut down most operations, and but it is still active. The computer is still actually on mm -hmm. in the sleep state. Hibernate, it is actually taking a snapshot of everything that's going on right now. Like all the files, everything that's open, everything. Taking a, taking a snapshot of it, saving that to your hard drive. So the downfall of Hibernate is it actually is saving the stuff to the hard drive, so you actually need enough hard drive space to accommodate for this. So a lot of times they will not have this function turned on automatically because of the hard drive requirement. And it will essentially shut down after that point completely. And then when you turn the computer back on, it will reboot and reload everything you were working on. That makes sense? 
So which one, Kelly, would be a good option for me if I'm um, <laughs> doing what you just said, kind of <clears throat> going from um, a dining room to my apartment, um, studying and stuff. And I usually, I don't turn my laptop off. I just shut the lid and throw it in my um, bag. So well, which I mean, should the same I? Building? Are you getting in, the, are you getting, you know, in a car or your, your trans, you know, there's a trend, you know, a transit involved where you're literally going to be, the computer's going to be closing in that bag for a long period of time, like 30, 40 minutes. Or no, I'm walking just, like two blocks. Two blocks. Yeah, so what, about just, 10, 15 minutes? Uh, it's more like, uh, yeah, about that, eight minutes at the most. Because it's a straight line. Eight, eight, ten minutes? I don't yep. see where that would damage the components unless you're talking like high summer, high, you know, in, in Vegas, high summer. Yeah, that would potentially damage the computer. So I would adjust your uh, behavior at that point where I would shut it down. It's only going to cost you, you know, maybe about 30, 40 seconds. So that would probably be a better option. But like winter, spring, where it's not so hot, eight, 10 minutes walking through, that's probably not going to affect it much. You know, the my coworker had a 45 minute to an hour commute. So they were like literally had their computer in that state in a uh, laptop bag for about a, almost an hour. But eight, 10 minutes, as long as it's not extremely hot, you should be okay. Okay, does it matter if I'm, <clears throat> like more normally I'm just doing that generation module stuff or the mm -hmm. test out stuff. But what if I'm, I have one video game on my computer. That's um, a role-playing game called Dungeons and Dragons online. It's kind of like a cheap version of EverQuest or wow or fantasy final fantasy, whatever that's called. Um, if I'm playing that, um, is that going to heat up my computer really bad? while you're playing it or when it's in hibernation mode? When I stop, I put it in hiber or when I shut the lid, put it in I my mean, bag. It and in sleep mode, it, well, when you put it in sleep mode, it should, you know, basically put a lot of these into a uh, paused state. Okay, so it doesn't matter what I'm actually doing. It just matters how long I keep it there in the bag depending yeah. on the weather it's outside. The, it's the keeping it in the bag because your fans are going to be running. It's still going to be generating heat and you're in an insulated bag. That's where the problems are coming in with that. All right. I get it. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions with regards to that? No. All right. Uh, programs and features. Now, Windows has a tendency to have a whole laundry list of programs that come with it. Not all of them are installed right away. And it also depends on the version of Windows you have, be it home or pro or ultimate or enterprise or education of uh, the things that they will, you know, allow to be on there and be on there. So in program features, you can actually start adding and removing these programs as you want them. And they're not necessarily there right when you start. So, you know, it's not taking up that extra memory. You don't have all that bloat. You can go in there and have these installed and then start utilizing them. Or if they are features that you're not using on a regular basis, you can go and have them removed and free up that memory space for yourself so that you don't have these unneeded and unwanted programs clogging up your hard drive which was a nice feature they've added recently. In the beginning, they didn't used to do that. And it was basically, you had to take all of it or nothing. Any questions with programs and features? Right. Home group, I believe Lazaro taught, touched on this one pretty good. Uh, not available in Windows 7. Uh, does anybody remember what it was called at that point? Or the version of it was called? I'm not mistaken, I believe it was called Work Group. Is that correct? Marvin or Laz? So. It is Work Group. So on. Okay, so on Windows 7, they called it, huh? Well, I remember work group, but I think I remember work group from um, Windows NT. So it might have been Windows 7 I mean, too. 
Yeah, Windows had Workgroup for a while. And does anybody remember, buddy, remember how many computers you could have in a Workgroup? Doesn't mean you should have that many, but they would allow you up to a certain point. A wild guess, 128. <laughs> That's way too high. <laughs> This would be for like very small offices would use this right off the bat. You know, if you got above this number, you'd want to start setting up your own domain. 32. Did you say Alvarez? It was 10. Uh, nope, a little higher than that. Double it. Hmm. 20. 25, I believe is the exact number. 25. Okay. 10 is what you would reasonably not want to go above because other than, you know, if you start getting above that, you have too much um, crosstalk and chatter going on on the lines and it becomes your, the system starts getting bogged down really easily. So 10 would be about what you, in real life, you wouldn't necessarily want to go above, but for the purposes of the exam, 25 is your absolute ceiling. Yeah, that's why I was thinking about 10 because I was thinking about if you got that many things connected, the network when you wouldn't want to go above that because that's that, that would be like on a um that would be a bus system or it could just be on any kind of uh topography i mean you could have it on a ring you could i mean you could set it up on a star you know however you want to okay. set it up but if if you're all sharing files and stuff like that think you know within with regards to this only one computer can talk at a time uh so you start to you start to get a lot of lag, and you know things are getting bogged down because all these different computers are trying to talk to, talk at the same time. You know, nice. It's only milliseconds, but over time, that stuff adds up. Yeah. So for Windows eight, eight point one, and ten, they use Home Group. But it, Laz, didn't you just say that they don't use Home Group anymore in ten? So they've removed that feature. Yeah, I think also Windows eight. That I have to do research, but I think they got rid of an eight as well. Somebody has to correct me on that, but for sure 10, they just might uh, remove features from the users, unfortunately. Well, yeah, I think because for the purposes of the exam, I believe they state that eight, 8.1 and 10 have home group. So it might've been a recent um, service pack on 10 that has removed home group in it. Probably. and. I know later on, I actually know it was last T session, oh, I had to leave, uh, that now the new Windows 10 is no longer 16 to 20 gigabytes, depending on what you're installing based on the service pack. But I hopefully everyone realizes that on the exam, they're expecting you what we showed you, 16 or 20, depending yeah. on the bit. So don't get confused when you look online, finding out it's more than 20 gigabytes. That's why you got to be careful. What, what you put in the exam, and that's what yeah. we're here to explain, just in case. Same thing with this one for because sure. They keep changing it. Yeah, the, <laughs> the CompTIA exam is about two to three years old at this point. They're going to likely be doing a revamping of the material, I'm guessing, in late this year or early next year. So as of now, this is like two to three years old. So we're, that's why we keep stating with you know with regards to the exam versus real life because things have changed obviously since the exam was written gotcha i think right. in the books uh, I, I saw that the maximum is since starting 2019 uh they're looking for 32 gigabytes the maximum i mean the minimum is that what okay it is? I don't know. starting in 2019 it's a uh, 32 gig yeah, minimum yeah I wonder what it is now. <laughs> it might be higher now. I think I saw in the book, maybe, if I'm not wrong. No, you're correct. I did okay. research on that because uh, when I was taking the CompTIA exam, I wanted to make sure I got the right one. Good news is that for the CompTIA, if they say install, like you're doing a clean install on Windows, it will be what we put up. It's either going to be 16 for 32 or it's going to be 20 gigabits. Uh, sorry, gigabytes, if it's a 64-bit operating system, because it's talking about install, meaning the original service pack. So that's how you would know. I highly doubt they're going to be such a complicated question. It's not fair, in my opinion. 
if they tell you, oh, it's 32 bit because it's a different server pack. No, I doubt it. That's going to be a more higher level certification or a specialized certification. Because I find that very unfair because Windows changes every Tuesday, for those who are not aware. Big update Tuesday. Every Tuesday, Windows has an update. Yep. And sometimes they change. Also remember the that Tuesday's update day because that could also come up. Because they'll ask you who updates once a year, who updates every Tuesday, who is basically a random update. So that's that's something they like to ask as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Great question, all right, man. and basically, home group kind of allows everybody to share files, folders, all that fun stuff with each other, and um, kind of operate as a internal network instead of having a domain or a overseeing server. You're essentially operating off of each other's computers, and you're granting access to each other through that. Uh, okay, devices and printers pretty much what it is. It's everything that is connected to your computer, be it a mouse, a keyboard, a printer, game controller, whatever you can think of, hard drives, um, anything you want to hook up to it, you would go through devices and printers to get that established. Sometimes you are not, you know, the computer doesn't recognize what it is. So you can go in there and search for hardware changes and it'll bring up a new device and then you can actually go and bring in the the drivers you need to actually run those devices. And all of that would be taken care of in the devices and printers applet. Any questions with regards to that? Nope. Oh, okay. Sound, pretty much what it says it is. That's where you, you know, set your um, volume for your speakers, uh, microphones, input. Uh, you may not necessarily want to use your internal speakers, so you may be adding, you may have line outs to, you know, better speaker systems, especially if you're into gaming, you want 3D sound and stuff like that. You might have subwoofers, all that stuff you would manage through sound. Any questions on that? So sound is, you know, is both input and output. So both microphones and speakers, all is handled through there. Troubleshooting applet, most common uh, issue you come across. That's where you would go. You could, it has basically an internal document directory, almost like what you would have if you were doing customer service where you kind of type in the problem and then it would bring up various solutions to help you fix it or run a quick troubleshooting software. I've never found it overly useful, but it is there and a lot of people do enjoy it. And uh, it seems to help out with a lot of the real quick, easy fix problems. Any questions with the troubleshoot applet? All right, network and sharing center. I think this is what they use now to replace home group within um, Windows 10 and where you can essentially just state within your local network what you want to share, be it printers, be it files, movies, um, documents, all that fun stuff. You would put all that together in this one location and you could, you know, set your permissions and allow things to be shared or not shared visible to others on the network or not, or what people, what other devices on the network would have access, not just everybody on the network have access. Uh, device manager um, is kind of related to the devices and printers, where if you wanted to adjust um, the settings on your printers, game controller, stuff like that, you could come in here and make the adjustments like um, other driver updates, whether or not the um, devices you have are actually showing accurately, like the accurate version of that device. And it's not just an older or a generic version of that driver. You could go in and 
do this. Also, you can allow um, set permissions for these devices, what they are and are not allowed to do, like auto run you don't, or auto play. Do you want every time you plug in a USB drive into your computer that it auto runs that USB drive and whatever files are you know, set on it? That's absolutely something you do not want to have on an enterprise computer and likely not on a home computer either. So any questions with regards to device manager? All right. These are basically your quick commands for the Microsoft Management Control NMCs. And you could get, when you go into the uh, search function on your computer, if you go ahead and you just put in, you know, the command for this, be it um, like your domain, you just type in domain.msc and it will take you straight into that uh, setting rather than you having to search for, you know, go through the control panel or any of that stuff. It's just a quick way to find these things through these basic commands. So some of the more common ones, performance monitor, um, remote desktop, service manager, terminal service manager, event viewer, and a lot of these things like that. So this is just a quick way to get to these devices rather than going through your control panels. Any questions with that? You do not have to memorize all of these, but have a general understanding of it. Uh, so you come off. <laughs> That's all. That's all. Last coming off. Gotcha. Yeah, it's basically just have an understanding that this would be a way you could get to this stuff, but no, you do not have to memorize all of these. Absolutely not. What were you about to say, Les? Was. No, I wasn't talking. Oh, sorry. I saw you come off mute, so I thought you were kind of you wanted to add something. Oh, don't worry about that. It happens sometimes on this computer when I'm. Uh, it's just my computer. Sometimes when I'm clicking somewhere, because I have multiple windows, it's a glitch where it thinks I'm clicking on it and I'm not clicking on it. Oh, gotcha. All right. UAC. The user account control. This yeah. is kind of where you can go ahead. Who's on? Oh no, I was just talking to myself. I said I remember that that was very aggravating. The user account control. Um, that was the one that kept asking you, "Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this?" Yes, and you know, from a uh, systems administrator point of view, this is a wonderful tool. From a general user point of view, this is a very aggravating tool because sometimes you want to upload something for your job or, you know, something that you think will make your job easier and a lot of that and stuff like that. But basically, this is where you would go to set it up saying, no, I do not want other users uploading software that has not been pre-approved. So, you know, to in order to protect the system. So, you know, it, it, it is more of a security feature. Um, you know, yes, you can go back to restore. Do it. I say, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, and I understand from a, like, you know, especially like if it's on your home computer, every single time, you know, asking you, do you want it to, you know, do you sure you want to upload this? You sure you want to download this? You sure you want to do this? Now with regards to you, if it's your computer, absolutely you want to do it because that's why you clicked on it. But right. if your kids or whatever are working on your computer, no, you absolutely don't want them downloading every single thing that they see on the internet. So, you know, the user access control or account control is very, very wonderful for those particular things. There's also one extra thing too. Let's say it is your personal computer. I have it at the Mac setting because I'm scared that a malware will try to pretend that I am the user and manipulate your computer. It's a very common tactic and that's why a lot of other operating systems if you're very familiar with windows you probably hate it because when vista came out i had that feature it was an old feature that should have been from the start like apple or linux they have that it is way too easy to just hit yes when you see a question pop up yeah 
This is basically Windows being behind and now telling the user, hey, you have to start doing this now because we forgot to put a security feature that basically lets any other hacker hack your computer by pretending to be you. So that's a very important thing to know for the exam. You may get a question saying, why would I want to have it? It could be to prevent malware. So if you have a question related to malware and it's related to UAC, user access control, that could be a solution to the question depending on how they word it. So just keep that in mind. Absolutely. And we just went over this real quickly, um, setting up researcher access to you know, non-administrative users through user access control to prevent uploading stuff, as well as allowing um, unintended malware into the system. Group policy. This is a pretty powerful tool uh, for administrators. Um, basically allows you to restrict what can be accessed, uploaded, used, pretty much a huge amount of features for any computer underneath the administrative control. And you can use it for all the users on a singular computer or essentially all the computers on an entire network. And you can set up different group policies, say for your HR department than you would for your operations department, than you would for your sales department, than you would for your accounting department. So you, you can allow different levels of access and different levels of um, abilities within each of these groups. And it makes it a lot easier for you when you have somebody new coming into the team, you basically just apply whichever group policy needs to be applied to that system and it helps set up all those features for you. And then the, um, the code that you would, or the, where you need to go, the gpedit.msc, that would be where you would go to actually edit these things on your own personal computer. I definitely, if you have a Windows system, you know, recommend going in, looking at it, and just kind of looking at the features that you can adjust and change and manipulate through the group policy control. And as, you know, obviously you need to do this from administrative access. If you try to do it from a user access, it may not allow you, but you can also set it up, you know, like you don't want them to have access to the control panel at all. You don't want them changing the display settings. You don't want them changing the um, screensaver settings because you want it set for five minutes and when they come back, they have to put their password in. If they get annoyed with that, you don't want them turning that feature off. Um, in our, uh, the, the company I used to work for, it was so extreme, it wouldn't even let you run your own virus scan or defrag. It wouldn't let you do that yourself, even though it was basic maintenance because they had it scheduled themselves and they didn't want you changing or turning it off. So any questions with regards to group policy? But again, I absolutely recommend going in, messing around with it a little bit. Obviously be careful before you change anything but definitely look through and see what kinds of things with regards to security, you know, control panel, all that kind of stuff that you can actually restrict access to or grant access to based on the user. You can do it for say some of the users on your computer and then others, they get full access. So you can allow yourself full access, but when your kids get on there, no, they can't turn off parental controls. They can't, you know, change any of the other stuff that you have on there. It's just only certain users can do certain things. And basic screenshot of the group policy editor. But CompTIA does like to ask about where would you go to restrict user access to certain things or allow user access to certain things, and that would be the group policy editor. All right. Quick note about that. For that, it's only for professional and above for Windows Edition. So if you're looking for it, you can't find it unless you have an upgraded version or better version, basically, of Windows. Oh, good point. 
Yeah, so don't get fooled if you're like, oh, I can't find it. It's not right. Nope, it's there. Believe it or not, it's just Windows doesn't let you access the feature unless you have paid the money for it. <laughs> I think the only ones we didn't go over real quick were the um, credential manager where you would go to store all your credentials for, you know, say like, you know, Microsoft Edge, you know, passwords, you know, and single sign on stuff like that. You could do that in your credential manager. BitLocker for encrypting your entire hard drive. So full disk encryption. Um, all that would be managed as far as like password, all that stuff would be managed within the BitLocker. And then Sync Center is with regards to syncing mobile devices to your computer, like phones, tablets, and things of, of that nature. Any questions with regards to that? All right. Hopefully, after this C session, you'll be able to describe how you can use the control panel to customize the operating systems for a client and describe the key steps and considerations when configuring a Windows for a client and identify common pitfalls that can occur when configuring Windows and how to solve them. Any questions with regards to this T session? Hmm. If no one has.